Welcome back to Beards and Brews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, nail that bell, so you know when we have another one brewing. This week's movie is going to be Chicago. Fellas, you want to tell me about all that jazz? Uh, are you talking about Sucker Punch 1920? <laughs> yeah, I, I got that vibe. This is the movie that Sucker Punch was really trying to be, and it kind of gave me a chuckle. I kind of get that. Um, like, Sucker Punch is definitely a little bit more stylized, but this is a little bit uh, better. I mean, like, this movie is all style. I think the difference is it kind of juggles its exposition inside of its musical number. It just makes it way more pliable and enjoyable. Yeah, much easier to follow, too. It's almost like the movie and the musical are happening, happening concurrently. Yeah, plus we have the band leader, Tay Diggs. I didn't remember he was in this at all, <laughs> but he plays a pretty big, important part in this, and I think he does a really good job just sort of being the the secondhand narrator of what we're actually seeing. He does a great job, like, differentiating the different acts in the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his his uh, announcing of the next, you know, uh, vignette is always very... What's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, it's it's Even the way he says it is poignant. It's very nice. Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah. pretty much what this movie is. It's just like moving from vignette to vignette. There's very little in the middle, um, and I think that really works well. And that gives the movie like a really good pace, and like nothing's ever boring or anything. Like even the actors have like just enough time to shine. Nobody bogarts the mic or anything. The movie's just always trucking forward and a lot of fun. Yeah, that's something that's really weird for a musical to me, anyways. Is that you're having a good time, even if the song, like there's a couple songs that I didn't really care about, but visually you're entertained through the song regardless. Yeah, I'm not a huge musical fan. Like I've seen a few, I've enjoyed a few. Uh, yes. This is done really. Well, yeah. yes. This is uh, <laughs> one of the few that I've really, really enjoyed. And a lot of that comes down to your main stars. You got Catherine Zeta Jones and Renee Zellweger. We'll get into the actual plot here in a little bit. But those two just sort of going back and forth, it's, you know, kind of compelling. See, to me, the, the stars here are definitely Catherine Zeta, Richard Gere, once he shows up. Holy fuck. Oh, yeah. And Great. then I, I didn't really care for Renee Zellweger. She's whatever. But I was super into seeing what the fuck was happening to John C. Cuck. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fucking Simp C. Riley. He's just at it again. And it, he even has like a really good uh, set of pipes on him, too. He sings in this movie. And he's great. He does a great job in his song. Yeah, he really does. Like, you you think of John C. Riley as a certain type of actor, and then he shows up in things like Chicago and The Lobster, which we covered just a couple weeks ago. And, man, this guy's got some, some range. It's kind of weird, you know, you see him go from Step Brothers, like, it, opposite end of the spectrum, he's on, like, uh, that Vietnam movie where, like, like, they were raping people with Michael J. Fox. Like, he has that fucking range. It's crazy. What? Uh, Sean Penn was in it. I don't know. It's not born on the 4th of July. It's something, not something. It's like the sequel, Platoon, but with like a two in it. Platooned. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever it is, I evidently have not seen that. It's just Platoon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But the first vignette that we get is like sort of our introduction to the whole movie. It's a song, All That Jazz, and I think it's primarily just sung by Catherine Zeta-Jones. It's really just giving True. the introduction to who the main characters of this are. And you think that Catherine Zeta-Jones is going to be the main character. She comes in uh, to the club that she works at and she hides a pistol in the drawer. And you're like, I guess that probably wasn't anything, right? I guess she had enough like Sean Connery shit from Entrapment. Fucking popped him, just went to work the next day like nothing happened. Speaking of Entrapment, she is much better here than she is in that movie. Like, I could stand to watch her act in this. She she puts on a good show as opposed to Entrapment where you're like, shut the fuck up. And what's great about this whole bit at the beginning, I, I guess it's more of like a prologue. Like, it shows you basically what's going to happen to our actual main character, uh, Renee Zellweger, like later on in the movie. Just all like scrunched into like the first 10 minutes. Yeah, scrunched as much as her little uh, like nose and mouth are through the whole thing. Nice. Yes. <laughs> just like... <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention that all that jazz, this song is probably the highlight to me of the film. There's a couple other ones that are really good, and you're like, hey, those are catchy. But this one, this is the one. It gets stuck in your fucking head. Oh, no, this ain't the one for me. 
Yeah, I think we all have our own little unique favorite. That's kind of nice. Uh, but, you know, she comes into the club, puts away that pistol, gets up on stage, does her little song and dance. We start to see the cops move in and you're like, huh, maybe that pistol wasn't anything anyway. And we do get to meet Renee Zellweger's character, Roxy, as she, you know, watches from the back of the club. Yeah, and as the police bust in and arrest Catherine Zeta-Jones, and it's no big mystery, uh, but what is weird is that Renee Zellweger is banging this other guy, and every woman in this movie is a criminal. Yeah, for sure. Like, the movie doesn't try to, like, gaslight you or anything. Like, these are people that are murderers, and the whole shtick is like, hey, if you put on a good enough show, a la, like, a Broadway show, you can just get let off, you know? Well, there is one that we'll get to a little bit later. One that was not a criminal. Uh Uh-uh. Not guilty. Yeah, her. (laughs) But yeah, uh, Roxy, she's kind of a scumbag. That's uh, Renee Zellweger's character. She says, you know, her husband Amos ain't going to be home till midnight. Uh, So, you know, why don't you just stay and play as she messes around with this guy? I don't know. Yeah, just this guy this guy yeah furniture salesman scummy ass furniture salesman yeah for sure after they like they screw around like he just like gets out of bed and he's like all right i've had enough Uh, i'm a furniture salesman get the fuck off me i gotta hit the bricks i done poked you in the love seat time to hit the bricks dude he was like really scummy like he was like hey go wash yourself off so you and the husband can have round two later or something like that i was like fuck (laughs) straight up Straight up natural born killer style, like I'm gonna come in there late and see how clean ya. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even like dally around with the idea of maybe we'll want to hook up again. It's just like, no, I gotta, I gotta not do this anymore. Uh, we're we're done. Uh, bye. He's like, man, I actually got five kids to feed. Oh, nice. <laughs> Screw you, Benny. <laughs> But then, ha cha cha cha, murder! <laughs> she fucking smokes him, and there's she's a, a little bit of murder. Ace shot, an ace, a shot, little bit okay? of murder. <laughs> and like, I have to give props to like the policeman in 1920 Chicago. They're just fucking Johnny on the spot. She plugs the guy like three times, and they're just basically already at the door knocking. Like, Miss, uh, ma'am, uh, did you murder this ma'am? And John C. Riley's like, I did it freely and gladly, cause I'm such a cuck. Yeah, he's just a doofus. I guess she has him tell the cops that he did it. He shot the guy. Uh, He was like an intruder coming in through the window trying to burgle them. But there's also one of the funniest fucking lines right here. He's like, uh, he was trying to burgle her. And then the cop's like, oh yeah, from what I hear, he's been burgling her three times a week for a couple months. (laughs) Yeah, I do remember that line. I wrote down a few lines from this this little uh, back and forth. Yeah, they... It, the lines here are fucking hilarious. Like John C. Riley is trying to take the blame because he loves her so much. Then he realizes, and the cops like, "Hey, this is so and so, Frank, the furniture salesman." He's like, "Wait a minute, that guy sold us our furniture. Holy shit, you're cheating on me!" <laughs> you know, two and two's together here. And, and he's like, "Fuck you, bitch! <laughs> I'm gonna rat you out." And she's like, "How could you abandon me in my goddamn hour of need?" <laughs> Fred Casely, how could he be the burglar? She knows him. He sold us our furniture. Gave us 10% off. Son of a bitch, 10% off for some ass. Oh, but whenever she's getting escorted out by the police, she's like, I'd kill him again. And the cops all like, man, once was enough. I know you mentioned it before, but I just love how John C. Riley finally got the light bulb above his head just for that one moment. It's like, wait a minute, she's a whore. Yeah, down at the jazz club, sounds like you've been jazzing him the whole time. And all that jazz. Fucking... They sing the cuck hubby song, and then they get told <laughs> that she's going to, this is a hanging offense. Horse thiefing is a hanging offense. And she goes to, like, hot chick jail. Can I Can I get sent to that jail? There goes Chandler blowing away furniture salesman just to get in there. <laughs> Come at me, Big Sandy. <laughs> All right, but the first, uh, the first person that we meet once we get to the jail is Big Mama Morton. And she's introduced with her little vignette, you know, when you're good to mama, she'll be good to you. We get a real good idea of who Queen Latifah is in this role. Oh, real quick. And man, is she having fun? And that makes me have fun during this. Yeah. That's a good way to put like 
every actress or actor in this movie, like it feels like everybody is just like jazz, for lack of a better term. They're having fun, and the movie's fun. Agreed. Um, I also want to bring up something like production-wise. The lighting in this movie is fucking cool. Like they make it look so dark, yet you can see everything. It's weird. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, was... There's there's a lot of um, like it's not black and white or sepia tone. Like everything has color, but it's almost like you have that gray into it too. So it's like somewhere in between. Since it's supposed to take place in the twenties, it really gives you that idea. And I think that's what this movie has above like all these other musicals looking at you Moulin Rouge it's just like there's great care put into everything in just including the cinematography it's fantastic Cinema- <laughs> <laughs> but okay I don't, I don't want to get past that without uh, without making this point I do love Moulin Rouge I don't remember that one you and McGregor was the midget yeah the one thing that I really like about Moulin Rouge that this also does well is the uh, the stylism and that I mean, that might be why I like them both as much as I do. But jumping back to Queen Latifah here, she takes a dollar bribe and you you get like that quick intro to the world of this prison and her song, You Take Care of Mama, Mom Takes Care of You. If you pay her, she'll do whatever the fuck you want. Like you can run that shit and you get to see Catherine Zeta-Jones just in there in her finest of garments. Yeah, this is a women's prison. Everybody's wearing like these gray jumpsuits and Catherine Zeta Jones, because I guess she's got the money to do so, she's just wandering around looking like a like a harlot. <laughs> but it's also a great bit of the movie where you find out like not only is the mama like one of these characters where like, hey, if you know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, but like she's straight up hustling people. Oh fuck. That yeah. too, yeah. But, I mean, she takes care of her girls. Like, e- even in her introduction, you see her, like... We see her walking around, like, slipping a pack of cigarettes into her girl's pantyhose. Like, she takes care of who who takes care of her. Son, you got a panty on your head. Just drive. <laughs> <laughs> Reality kind of sets in when, whenever she's like, Mama, it's cold in here. And she's like, tough shit, bitch, and walks off. Yeah, no kid. Like, at that time of the movie, she's like, nobody. She you know, has no fame or rapport or anything. She's like, hey, you're just the new bitch. Bitch. <laughs> bitch, bitch. But this is a fun song, too. This is Stomp, yeah. 1920s. No, this is what I know and take from this movie. This is my all that jazz for you. This is the best song in the whole film, as far as I'm concerned. Cell Block Tango, so fucking good. We get to meet six girls and, you know, hear a little bit about their story, about, you know, how he had it coming. Except there yeah. is one girl who... who you know, through to all this, upholds her innocence. Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay, so yeah. let's let's just discuss our favorite of the group. Like, there was Pop, yep. Six, Squish, Uh uh-uh, uh, Cicero, Lipshits. You said shits. <laughs> uh oh, the one that uh, <clears throat> the one that I always remember is Squish. Her husband or whatever comes in while she's like carving up chicken, you know, making dinner, and he's you know, going crazy. You've been screwing the milkman. And she's like, what? And he's like, you've been screwing the milkman. He was crazy. And then he ran into my knife. He ran into my knife 10 times. He had it coming. Nice. But that also is absolutely my favorite. I love it. Just the way that she is like enunciating the words and the way that she's like, ah, putting like, these twists in her body's like, you've been screwing a milkman, twist, twist. And I was like, what? And he's like, you've been screwing a milkman, twist, twist. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> he was crazy. For me, it's a tie between that one and just Catherine Zeta Jones's at the end because hers has this like this weird climax in them after she did like the whole representation of the blood on her hands. Like the song after that is so much more lively. And as you pointed out earlier, like Catherine Zeta Jones is doing a fuck of a good job in this movie. Yes, she is. And just the way that she was like, and I caught him doing number 29, the spread eagle. And then you get to hear the spotlight like cock on. And then just like the people in the background doing that. It's hilarious. Yeah. yeah and, and this is kind of where we actually hear her backstory, given that she's one of the, I'd say, two main characters of this movie. Uh, we finally get to hear her side of what happened. Her and her sister had this, you know, singing and dancing act. You know, she would do all these dance routines and then she came back and saw her husband in bed with her sister. And uh, yeah, he had it coming. 
it's a really fun song. And what's really weird about this movie is that it hits every genre, I feel like. There's action with, you know, like, maybe not over-the-top 90s action, but there's action, there's drama, there's music, there's fucking comedy out the ass. Oh, yeah. They do a really good job spreading it thin, yet covering all their bases. Like, I found out this movie won Best Picture when it came out, and, like, that didn't surprise me at all. Every beat that it set up, just like, as you pointed out earlier, just knocks it out of the park every single time. Yeah, it's... They did a fucking phenomenal job for a movie that's just... I I even want to say, like, a a throwaway musical, but it's really fucking good. Next thing we know, we have a little bit of life actually in the prison. We see the girls, you know, doing their tasks, like, washing towels and stuff. And afterwards, our girl, uh, Roxy ends up going to mama or talking to mama what have you and and she's like well well what are you going to tell them you know what are you going to tell the the lawyer what are you going to tell the the jury about your case no 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 you can't tell them the truth you you got to talk to this lawyer and i'm gonna need a hundred dollars so that you can uh place a phone call to this guy thank you very much but like a little bit before the she was doing something with like the uh the dirty clothes or whatever and uh she was kind of peeping in on the conversation and, like, Captain Zeta-Jones got, like, a better deal at, like, 50 bucks. And she has that moment like, wait a minute, you charged... Oh, never mind. Yeah. It's a it's a clever little thing, you know, that she's fleecing her as hard as she is. Yeah. And Billy Flynn, the lawyer, now that he is introduced in the movie, it, it just goes up a notch immediately. Uh, Richard Gere's showmanship here is fucking applause worthy he is amazing in this as much as i want to hate richard gear especially for like the jackal no 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 <laughs> uh, from here on it is primal fear the musical oh ooh. b-i-double-l-y got the bitches stripping and we get introduced <laughs> to him with his little song and dance all i care about and we find out all he cares about is making that paper he even had that like whole musical bit of like, oh, all I care about are my bitches. And then like hard cuts to him just like taking whatever money he can from John C. Riley. Yeah. I've only got two of the 5,000. That's disgusting. And you're a big fat phony, but I'll take your money. <laughs> Slides all Boy. these dollars into his drawer. All right. Well, you know, I'll recoup some of this once I get her off. Um, This is also one of the funniest fucking bits during his vignette. Um, Renee Zellweger's character pictures him as this, you know, kind of like a white knight, and he's just doing it because he loves women. Uh, and he comes into the prison, drives there in this big fancy car, and it even does like a cut where the car is made of women, and I thought that was really cool. But he gets in there, and she's like, hey, um, I got I, I got $5,000 is a lot. I, can, I, you know, I'll fuck you. And he goes, oh, well, now that that's out of your system, fuck you, pay me. And I was like, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going back to that piece where John C. Riley shows up and pays him 2000 of the 5000 it reminded me exactly like Willy Wonka and the Charlotte Factory because like he puts down the money and he's like, get out. Wait, I'll take the case and your money. And he leaves happy, but, you know, he's just a swindler anyways. It reminded me of the gobstopper scene where... He's like, Charlie, you win nothing. Get the fuck out. And then Charlie's like, here's your gobstopper, man. I'm sorry. And he's like, Charlie, wait. No, you won. Thank you. It's exactly that. I didn't really have that parallel in my brain, but I I can see it now. And then John C. Riley walks away with the entire chocolate factory. (laughs) All right. So now we have Richard Gere starting to work on this case in earnest. We start hearing a little bit between him and Renee Zellweger's character. And he's he's telling her... No one's going to care what your defense is. It doesn't matter if you actually did it or not. We just have to make them care about you. We've got to make a story for you. She starts talking in this, like, Southern Texas drawl, you know, being this sweet little angel lady. Yeah, like, this whole list of stuff. She's just like, hey, where are you from? Uh, Nowheresville, whatever. Ah, I see. Money. And what about your parents? Probably sitting on the same farm on the rocking chair. Aha. Dead. And just They're like dead. So you are now a reformed sinner, drawn like a moth to the flame of sin and liquor. <laughs> yeah, she basically just turned into like Betty Boob, just like so kind of like innocent but not innocent. Like it wasn't my fault, but I totally did it. Yeah, you were yes. a good girl until you got caught up in the jazz and the gin joints and sin in Chicago. Just remember, about 15 years later, I want you to write a book if you had done it, and I need you to publish that immediately. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, yeah, I get 15% of the cover. Oh. Now, they style her up. She already had blonde hair, but they fucking give her like uber blonde hair. Like this cute little, almost like a pixie. Exactly what you picture when you see a flapper in one of those old movies. And her first night out, not really night out, but first you know public viewing where everyone gets to see her, they're like, oh my god, she's fucking adorable. So adorable that her hairstyle becomes a trend, prompting even Queen Latifah to don this blonde hairstyle. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Speaking of blonde hairstyles, what I have here today is from Lucky Luke Brewing Company. This is Luke's original American blonde ale. I have no idea where this is from, but it's a 5.4% American blonde ale, and evidently it won uh, the American Beer Festival's 2019 bronze medal for um, congratulations for blonde ale let's see if it lives up to that it is i can confirm a blonde ale pretty thin looking honestly pretty clear a little bit of weedy aroma it's actually better than i was expecting from the way that it looks it looks very light very thin and it's not like it's this full-bodied like thick monster or anything it is light but there is a good amount of flavor there a little bit of like biscuit or toast not a whole lot of fruity or floral uh flavors but there is a little bit of a hoppy base there so it's got something to balance it out this is actually pretty good i like it cool cool well hey speaking of third place uh, there's a little bit of tension like who gets the most media attention inside the prison now that uh, renee zellweger is like on the front page of all this stuff like Catherine zeta jones is kind of like falling behind yeah she's getting jealous yes so jealous that she's like, hey, let's let's team up. Let's be a buddy cop duo. Oh, man. This little number where, like, uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones is trying to, like, show her, like, what she would do if they were partners is fucking phenomenal. It's not my favorite, but it's fantastic because she's so desperate by that point. She's like, hey, oh, yes. I'll do this. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. And you'll do this. This is, like, desperation at its finest. <laughs> is this Dude. when we get the little uh, ventriloquist act with uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones and Richard Gere? You mean Renee Zellweger? Is it Renee Zellweger? Yeah. Yeah, is this where we get that little ventriloquist act between Renee Zellweger and uh, Richard Gere? Yeah, it takes place a little bit beforehand, but this one, this is my favorite number in the movie because it's so finely executed and infinitely entertaining. It's fucking phenomenal. Just the whole, they both reach for the gun, the gun, the gun. It's him leading the crowd to say it. And then yeah. the... The next verse, they pick it up because now they they know the rhetoric. They know what he's wanting them to say, and they're going with it. And it's like, holy shit, this is brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like uh, almost like propaganda. Oh, absolutely. And the fact that Richard Gere is at the helm of this entire thing, just leading people on, like like he said, like you have to just treat it like show business. It's all a show, and he has everybody by the strings. And even though it's, you know, more metaphorical, like the, the bit where they show him, like, you know, puppeteering the entire jury, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, the uh, the set here is recycled. They recycle the sets a lot, which actually works out and lends credence to the whole, you know, Broadway stage show, which is really neat. Uh, yeah. But even the makeup here with, you know, the dummy and the ventriloquist theme, it's this whole, the movie's good. <laughs> yeah, even, even like the attention to the finer details, like on uh, Renee Zellweger's back is like an actual like little lever prop that you would find inside of a ventriloquist dummy and stuff like that. Just like small things like that. And then you have like the bigger picture when you have like the entire jury on strings being propelled by Richard Gere, who is like a god figure above the stage. Yes, it's really fucking good. Now... What is really fucking great is the next scene you were talking about with uh, Catherine Zeta desperate. And she fucking slides onto the table like ha-cha-cha-cha. And she goes, well, where's the part where you blew your sister's brains out? I was fucking <laughs> dying. Dude, the entire time she was like 100% not impressed. Like she was mm -hmm. like trying to show her some moves and she was just like. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. she's even like, hey, you know, you happen to be just about the same size as my sister. Uh, it's a natural pairing. Renee Zell Zellweger's just like, eh. Pass. Yeah, yeah, fart noise. Get out of here, chump. Yeah. Now, Catherine Zeta sees that she's in a shit spot. Renee's now in the spotlight. But just like a fucking light switch, Lucy Lou shows up on the scene. And man, is she <laughs> looking good. I did not remember Lucy Lou being in this at all either. Was it? It's actually been a while. 
Yeah, that was Lucy Liu. She is in the credits. She comes in like a wrecking ball or fireball, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I guess she murdered her fucking husband, two other people, all that stuff. But she's like a hellion. Like, she comes in. And she's like, yeah, I fucking did it. What do you want to see? Hey, Mr. Photograph Guy, you want my picture? Kicks him in the nuts. And everyone's like, wow, she's great. Yeah, we get a brief little introduction to her. Uh, she walked in on her husband, who was asleep in bed with two other women, and she killed them all. And now the press just doesn't care about Roxy at all anymore. And really, neither does Billy, their lawyer. To be honest, like, I don't really feel bad for at least one of the women that uh, her husband got busted with. Because, like, she straight up fucking tried to hide behind the curtains. And she's like, yeah, <laughs> man, bulletproof as fuck. This is hilarious in its own right and then also very clever. Because they bring in this new character. And you're like, okay, this is where we're going to go with the focus now. But... Renee Zellweger has this really clever idea of, holy shit, my spotlight's being taken away. Yeah, the old Kansas City shuffle. Yep. <laughs> she just falls down and is like, oh, the baby. <laughs> yeah, she faint, She pretends to faint. And then, you know, once the press or whoever starts, you know, seeing, you know, what's up with that? What's going on? She's like, gosh, I just hope I didn't hurt the baby. Uh, even Richard Gere, like, runs over and hugs her, just like, mm, money. That was so good. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's exactly what he does. Like, he's hugging her, like, mm, money. And fucking, even uh, Catherine Zade is up on the stairs, like, fuck, well played. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the amount of hate respect that you see from her up there is incredible. It's like, man, I hate her. But goddamn, that was good. <laughs> Why did it sound like Michael Ironside from Starship Troopers again? Like, God damn it, Roxy, you're amazing. Go ahead and kill me, Roxy. Oh. <laughs> but her lawyer and mama take her to see a doctor. And, uh, you know, they take her in there. She walks out and is like, doctor, is she or isn't she? And the doctor's like, well, she is now. He's like, hey, would you testify that in court? He's like, yeah, well, good. Put your dick away and get out of here. <laughs> Just helicoptering it as he runs off. <laughs> it's the old stethoscope and uh john c Riley's like outside at her like press conference or whatever like i'm so excited i came as as soon as i could i'm so excited i'm the father you know mm -hmm. oh honey everybody's just like everybody's just like fucking ignoring him just like who is this fucking bloke in the middle of nowhere either that or should we tell him uh... Mari, i have something to say <laughs> and this is where we actually get his little song uh, Mr. I, Cellophane, which I don't really get, but I mean, it's a good song. Because he's just a Joe Blow dude. Like, he even mentions a couple times during the picture where, like, he's not exciting. He's just, like, regular fella. So, like, if you walked into him you know, on the street, you know, you wouldn't even notice him. But I have dude. to say, like, I absolutely love this number. Like, John C. Riley fucking hits a home run with this performance. Like, I didn't think he had it in him. Uh, I'm right there with you. His number is so fun. He's dressed like one of those like old timey hobo clowns that you see in a sad painting. Mm -hmm. And man, his his whole little number is okay. And then he near the end, he gets these two moments to really shine, uh, where he starts to really come up. And then he hits this fucking high note and holds yeah. it. I actually had to uh, look into that a little bit. Apparently, like he went to a um, a voice coach for a good while when he accepted this part and everything. So he actually learned how to sing in his register just for this movie. Wow. Boats so, and hoes. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end of this, he starts talking to the, the lawyer guy and he's, he's like, you know, just go along with it. Hand out cigars. Don't even worry about it when people laugh. And he's just like, laugh at what? Why would they laugh? Starts doing the, uh, the mental image of the lady standing in front of all like the, the numbers and graphs like her. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. He's so dumb. He's like so delightfully dumb too. Like I know he's basically like, you know, like a simple fella, but like, he's like, it was like, why would they laugh at me? I ain't funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, if she's three weeks pregnant and we haven't copulated in four months. It's a fun little thing. And he, he keeps getting those little moments of clarity where he realizes how fucking stupid he is <laughs> yeah for sure but like he gets like shrugged off immediately richard gear gets a, a phone call and everything he's just like well i'm just gonna divorce her 
And he's just like, why are you still here? Get out of my office, you know? He's like, <laughs> you got any goes, more money? Yeah, he just goes right back to, like, sad chump. I, get, I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Oh, dude, yeah, it's rough. Like, womp, womp, womp. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the next scene that we have is just, like, a little back and forth between Roxy and Richard Gere, the lawyer. And it's just, like, them blowing up at each other because Roxy thinks she can do whatever without him. And uh, mm. this scene doesn't really amount to anything. But then we find out that yeah. the, the Hunyak is what they call her, the Hungarian lady who was the uh-uh part of uh, the Cell Block Tango. She has lost her last appeal and is ready to hang. And yeah. we actually get a, a nice little song from her. Yeah, she has like a, some kind of like vanishing act or anything. She doesn't actually sing, I don't believe, right? Mm-hmm. She's like more of just like a, a high wire kind of act. Yeah, we get her little stage show. We see like what looks like a rope hanging when she's on the stage. And that's sort of butted up against her actually being led to the gallows in real life. It's really interesting how they go back and forth with like the ladies on the stage versus the ladies in the prison. Yeah, it, it's just a fantastic way to just have like both of those things carry at the same time Mm -hmm. and like in the real world she gets the noose around the neck and in the little fantasy world she puts the noose around her waist that's how they did it in heathers you know it's like this cool little thing and in that way it is quite a bit like uh like sucker punch which we talked about several months ago it's just it's done so much better here yeah. Agreed, a hundred percent. Like uh, she drops down in the Hungarian disappearing act, and it's a beautiful moment of woof, ha ha, to like a roaring applause of this magic show. When in reality, what that's depicting is her life leaving her body, and it's like yeah. wow. And it totally shakes up Renee Zellweger too. Like she sees her fucking hang and her body get taken away, and she's like, "Go, I better go make amends with Billy." Yeah. It's such a good cutaway because right before this, she's like, you're fired. He's like, fuck you. I quit because she's got she's full of herself. Mm-hmm. And as soon yeah. as uh-uh gets hung, she's like, hey, Billy, I <laughs> fucked up. Bring me that. Bring me that Amish outfit real quick. <laughs> yeah. It hard cuts to her in the outfit. And Richard would be like, here, learn how to knit in 10 minutes. He's like, yeah, I'd do anything, mister. Yeah. And, and he's just like cracking down on her now. All right. Do nothing. Say nothing. Look straight. And and don't be a cunt. Don't don't do it. Be, we need you to be a sweet old lady. Knit, wear the Amish dress, shut up. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, don't. And uh, the the next little musical number is Give Them the Old Razzle Dazzle. Yeah, the movie's been Richard gearing up for this whole court scene. And, oh. like, and when they finally get to the thing, it's the it's the act. It is the final number, well, at least in regards to like the whole court scene or whatever. And it's like a fucking three ring circus, like you mentioned before. Yes, it plays out through that so well. And I think it's like insane how well it goes because the way that he's being the circus performer, the way that he did the ventriloquist thing, the way that the court case is playing out in the background, they're giving you so much good courtroom exposition juxtaposed with this fucking circus entertainer. And it's brilliant. Yes. Dude, that's the perfect way to describe it. It is brilliant because I really did not want to go through like an hour and a half of musical and then like a half hour of Matlock. Bullshit. This <laughs> is a lot of fun. What if it was like a half hour of Columbo? <laughs> you just walk around. So yeah, the so you shot the man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so see, uh, well, I found this umbrella in my asshole. You want to talk to me about that? You know. It's like, and then John I... C. Riley turns around. Well, but just one more thing. No, John C. Riley's in the background still singing his fucking song. <laughs> like <laughs> nobody's paying attention to him. It didn't know he cut away from him. But we oh, do. Okay. Uh, we do get to see Richard Gere sort of pick apart John C. Riley. He's just doing his magic. And he's like, you filed for a divorce? When did you do that? Oh, well, uh, he's, he's really tries to confuse him. And he's like, well, did you, oh, even, did you even think to ask her if you were the father? And he gets caught up. Well, no. Well, I have no more questions. Like you said, he, like, he tried to confuse him. No, no, there was no trying involved. He's trying oh, to like, yeah. he just like immediately just like, fiddled his brain he was just like what i thought i was invincible or invisible my name's andy yeah (laughs) exactly if he was a cartoon that's the point where you'd hear like a screeching metal grinding and then like black smoke out of one ear he's just like a um overheating kettle oh yeah just coming to a boil just whistling just 
But you know, right when you think Richard Gere has like the jury in the palm of his hands, um, Queen Latifah had given Catherine Zeta Jones's Renee Zellweger's diary, <laughs> and in that diary, there's like a bunch of damning evidence. It's like her confessing all kinds of bullshit. So Catherine Zeta Jones uh, pleased this bargain deal, like you know, we'll drop all the charges if you just go ahead and testify. So she agrees. She comes to court with the diary, and she's like, "Hey, in this diary says." You know, I shot this guy and it felt good and I'd do it again. And the cop said you only needed to do it once. At that moment, Richard Gere turns from like, oh, this is easy street to like, I am full blown lawyer. Yes. And this is also business and money. Yes. It's oh. fucking good. He realizes, oh shit, this isn't a circus anymore. This is a one man show. Let me pour it on. And they start putting heavy lawyering again juxtaposed mm -hmm. with richard gear fucking like flash dance tap dancing sweating tap just dancing, working yes. his ass off what's brilliant about it is that not only is it tap dancing he's dancing around the evidence that's being given to him so he can still plead his case it's so fucking good you know, I mentioned earlier that there were two main characters, Catherine Zeta-Jones and Renee Zellweger, Roxy and Velma, respectively. Um, <laughs> I think there's three, actually. Once he joins the party, he is one of, if not the main character of this whole thing. It's, oh, yeah. it's, it's the Richard Gere show, as soon as he shows yeah. up. Man, it's good. It's one of those things where, like, we can applaud it, like, all day long. We can pick it apart, like, this is good, this is good, this is why it's good, but the feeling that you get while you're watching is phenomenal like man it's just so great yeah to think that a musical would have so many visualizations of poignant thought like tap dancing around the evidence literally dancing around it like it's a fucking euphemism but there it is happening on screen and on screen in a different uh, it's like mixed media and it's beautiful yeah, it's almost like the movie uses the musical numbers almost as like ammunition for the characters, if that makes sense. I can see that. But just to tidy things up, you know, like the whole diary thing falls apart pretty quickly. Richard Gere is just too fucking cool for that. And um, Catherine Zeta-Jones, unfortunately, does get off like on her charges because, you know, they're dropped when she agreed to be in the courtroom. But uh, Roxy gets off. Hey, she's not guilty. She did it. She worked the system. And immediately... She is dropped out of the public eye. Yeah. Well, like uh, what I love so much about this is we find out that Richard Gere is who orchestrated this whole diary thing in the first place. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Like uh, he brought up right at the end. like, well, where's all my newspapers? Why aren't they asking me the questions and taking my pictures? And he's just like, listen, I wrote some shit in that book and I didn't tell you because I know you'd fuck it up. You're free to go. Yeah, he talks about uh, adding a few erroneous phrases in there himself. This is a very, very good ending to this chunk. Um, she's innocent. There's newspapers outside with guilty and innocent printed on it. There's a guy waving out the window to let him know which one to throw onto the street. Yeah. As soon as the verdict is heard, there's another murder, and she's washed out of the limelight. Richard Gere walks by her, and she's like, no one's taking my picture. He goes, look, it's over. You won. Congratulations. But Chicago doesn't sleep. I gotta go. And he just he moves on to the change. next fucking case. Yeah, this is one of my favorite lines from him. He says, this is Chicago. There's nothing better than fresh blood. And he just moves on to get a part of that fresh blood. I like how everybody's okay with this super headlining murder case to be immediately followed by a murder on the courtroom steps or courthouse steps. Yeah, everybody's okay. I mean, except for Fred. Fred's not okay. Fred's dead. And, you know, drop dead Fred. That's what he does. Mm. Oh, Fred. Now, Amos is there, and he's like, you're going to come home. And she's like, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there ain't no baby. But I stuck with you the whole time. There was a, I made a song. Did you not hear it? And then, like, I forget what she, like, does afterwards. She starts, like, auditioning for parts and whatnot. Yeah, she's just sad because they don't want to take her picture anymore. And we get one more song with her uh, nowadays is what it's called, evidently. When she's up auditioning on stage for, like, a, another part at a club. Yeah. Yeah. She's just up there floundering, trying to make herself into somebody. And they're like, hey, wasn't she somebody? And they're like, yeah. She was. All right, well, that's enough. And she's shook by this. 
and Catherine Zeta Jones is also there, and she's like, "Hey, you know, I could help you out because I'm doing so good." Uh, and then you know, uh, Renee Zellweger is like, "Nah, still fuck that idea." But yeah. then she sees that she kind of stumbles and reveals that she too is out working the streets trying to find a fucking gig, trying to yeah, hustle. Yeah. She says, "One girl ain't shit, but two, two is something. We could make a couple hundred a week or something." I love how Catherine Zeta Jones finally gets Renee Zellweger on her side. She's like, "Well, you know, it's like, oh, we can make." A couple hundred a week, you and me, it'd be easy. It'd be great. And she'd be like, nah, go fuck yourself. And she's like, well, why? Like, why won't you join me? He's like, it was because I fucking hate you. <laughs> and then Catherine Zeta Jones is like, well, you know, there's only one business where you can get away with that. It's like, I fucking hate you. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. And like hard cuts into the final number of the movie. And it's just like them back at the top again, I guess. You know, they made it. Yeah, they got this super like jazzy little ragtime thing going on. It's evidently called Hot Honey Rag. But they're these like spunky flappers now. And they're playing on a big stage. Coming out with these like painted white Tommy guns. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's something. And the whole song is just about them laughing at their murders and how they got away with it. And boy, they were sad once, but not now. This is their if I did it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. They're just juicing around. It's it's a wrap. And the the moral of the story is, you know, be hot and famous and you can get away with crazy shit. Amber I think Heard. that's exactly what the story is. Yeah, I'd say so. Hell, even Richard Gere was in the audience. You'd be like, yeah, yeah those are my girls. Ooh. I think it really says something that, you know, us three guys who were normally talking about you know, action films or adventure or, you know, me who's more into like dark comedy. I think it says something that we all talk through this, a musical, like a theatrical musical film. And we all loved it. Um, yeah, when... it. It really says something. And I think that's, you know, a big reason why it won best picture that year. This is a phenomenal film. I, you know, can't recommend it enough. I 100% agree. Uh, I even had this conversation with my girlfriend. She's like, a musical? If you watch that, don't you get a case of the gaze? I was like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, this movie supersedes all expectations. This movie goes above and beyond your expectations. Like, I, I know I'm putting this on such a high pedestal, but like, this is my favorite feature film musical of all time. Uh, when Brady put it on the list, I was absolutely excited to watch it again because it had been forever. This movie is extremely well-paced, well-acted, well-shot, well-directed. It's a hell of a lot of fun. The music is fantastic. Everything in it is just a blast and just a well-made movie. I couldn't recommend it enough. I I can't agree more. There's only one thing that I think should have happened that didn't. Amos should have killed her in the courthouse. Ooh. Oh, that would have been the twist <laughs> of the century. Fuck yeah. And then we could have had Chicago too. Amos and Tay Diggs. <laughs> Oh, he could have been famous Amos. Damn, he's a oh, man. Oh, we are on to something, fellas. Are we going to call Richard Gere? He's on this. He he he's still like, gets paid in gerbils, right? <laughs> what? Dude, I got nothing negative to say about this movie. Like, I, I fucking, I've seen it five times in theaters. No wow. shit. I love this movie. I, I love Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I can fucking sit down right after watching Predator and be like, fire up Chicago and let's do this. Well, there you have it and all that jazz. That was Chicago. Uh, if you have any strong feelings about the movie or the podcast, leave it in the comment section below. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons. Hit the little bell icon. I mean it. Hit the bell icon so you know next time we got another one of these brewing. Get out there and follow us on all the different social medias. We got a shit ton of them, y'all. We got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Reddit. We don't have a MySpace, uh, but we have fucking Spotify. YouTube, Apple Podcasts, thanks to the Anchor app, y'all. I mean, we're we're out there. Give us a listen. Anywhere and any way you want it, that's the way you need it. Any way you want it, that's the way you'll get it.